Amen. And today I want to continue in the fruit of the spirit. And we're going to go with gentleness today. Fruit of the spirit, gentleness. And I want to start off by saying uh, those that are Christians and if we expect to go after God without any resistance, you might as well hang that up right now. Because once you start getting serious with God, the enemy is going to get serious with you. So part of that is learning how to recognize when he is working in our lives and not put it on a person because the Bible says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. And if we remember that in our relations with people and with our family, with the public, we will avoid a lot of confrontations. So part of this Fruit of the Spirit series is warfare. There is a war that's going to be on when you try to have the character of Christ in your life. There is going to be some resistance, so be ready for it. It's not just about reading a couple scriptures, reading your Bible. Yes, those are very important things because that keeps your spirit man alive. That keeps your spirit man exercised along with prayer, fasting, and all the other things that are shown in the word of God that God made available to Christians to be able to walk through this life victorious. Yes, we're going to fall down. We might hurt ourselves, but we get back up because we know if we turn our backs and rebelling, turn our backs and go back to what we came from, the Bible already shows that the end will be worse than the beginning. So we might as well make up our minds that we're going to follow Christ. Because even if we follow him in a lukewarm way, as shown in Revelation chapter 3, I, that's not part of my sermon, but... Christianity can't be walked in a lukewarm way either because in doing it that way, we're teeter-tottering on the fence spread like this. We have one foot over here and one foot over here. So we are in an indecisive mode almost because there is going to be some pulls on your life. And we talked about temptations and temptations are not just sexual. They're not just what pops in a person's mind when they think of temptations. We're going to be tempted like the Israels to be disgruntled. We're going to be tempted to doubt. We're going to be tempted to give up. But the Bible says don't be weary in well-doing so part of not being weary is maintenance when we feel weary we've got to maintain do what we know go back default to what we know and that is stand close to the word of god stand close to him in prayer i'm not talking about being a monk i don't know where that came from I'm talking about living Christianity in a natural way that pleases God. Because what? It's not about being an actor. That is the height of hypocrisy. Actually, another word of hypocrisy is actor. So we've got to do more than just act the part. I said so many times, and I'll say it in this sermon. Church is not a building. Church is not the Internet. Although church happens in a building, it happens on the Internet. But church 
is in your heart and it's always going to be there. And a term came out of nowhere. I was preaching a couple weeks ago, Ichabod. Ichabod in the Old Testament means the glory has departed. Isn't that a shame? To have the glory that you once had, to have the reverence for the Lord, the fire for God, and wanting to do what God called you to do, then all of a sudden, that glory departs and it slips away. And that is how our spirit man can be. Our spirit man can get empty and it's parched and it's thirsting for living water. So we don't want to get to that point. We want maintenance. We want to maintain what we got in the Lord, but not only maintain, but grow. If you're not growing, you're dying. Look at plants. A perfect example. If you're not growing, you're dying. You're getting cold. You're getting lukewarm. You're getting an I don't care attitude. What happens? I don't care what happens. That's the danger zone. And we don't want to get there. And all Christians, it doesn't matter at what maturity level they were. We're all susceptible to the powers mentioned in Ephesians chapter 6. Especially when we put our hands on the plow with the intentions not to look back. He's going to say, all right, buddy. Not Satan himself. He doesn't have to come to any one of us. And matter of fact. We're not important enough to him for him to come to us, really. That's why he's got a kingdom. And his kingdom does his bidding. So we've got to wonder, do we really want to do this? <laughs> do we really want to do this thing called Christianity? Or do we want to play and be actors? Play like we're Christians. Act the part. Now God's looking at your heart when you're doing that. And he has compassion on us. He's looking at our hearts closely. And no human being can examine another person's heart like God can. I want to put that in there right now. When we think we know somebody's heart. We better think about our own hearts because we're neglecting our own walk with the Lord. And that's a dangerous thing. So we left off. I want to keep preaching, but I want to teach too. Because teaching is the bedrock. Teaching is one of the most important elements in being a Bible student and wanting to learn the Bible in spirit and in truth, not what we think it's saying or what we want it to say, but what it actually says. Yes, it hurts us if it applies to us. No, that's for Brother John. That's for Sister Marie. That's not for me. I've been a Christian for umpteen years and seen everything in the body of Christ except myself. I'm going to tell you. When you start trying to have the fruit of the spirit in your life, you're going to be challenged. And challenges do what? Make you stronger or they defeat you. But in Christianity, defeat is not the end. It's just the beginning. Because we have to get back up and fight. And we have to get back up, not in our own strength, but in the power of the Holy Spirit. So we left off at part two, teaching on long suffering. And it's called long suffering in God's glory. And that was the 29th teaching of our fruit of the spirit series in Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 and 23 says but the fruit of the spirit is love joy 
peace, long suffering, gentleness. That's what we're going to be discussing today. Goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And that phrase, against such there is no law, this phrase means living according to the fruit of the Spirit will always be good and right and will never be forbidden by any righteous law. Nothing in the Old Testament or civil law will forbid being good and right. The fruit of the Spirit are opposite of the works of the flesh. Galatians chapter 5 verses 18 through 21 but if ye be led of the spirit, ye are not under the law. Verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. And we did a teaching on this where we gave the definition of each one of these. So I'm not going to dwell on that today. Verse 20 idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murderers, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That is one reason why I highlight repentance in my teachings. Not repentance to go back and do it again, to repent again. But repentance as a life changing. We're trying to change the behavior that we were doing. Not do the behavior and then say, God, I'm sorry, repeat it repetitively. So verse 18 slightly differs from the phrase against such there is no law that we read at the end of the fruit of the spirit verses. But in Galatians chapter five, verse 18, Paul is referring to the Mosaic law. In the Old Testament before the cross of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. After the cross of Jesus Christ, we are more focused on internal transformation rather than following the rules of the Mosaic law because they couldn't follow them. So Jesus made a way to be forgiven and it's called the law of Christ, the law of grace, the law of mercy. The qualities that we will produce by the fruit of the spirit are so obviously good that no law would ever prohibit them. And we are being encouraged to live according to the spirit of God to the best of our abilities, keeping it in our heart and mind. Amen. When we allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives, we show the traits mentioned in Galatians 5, 22 through 23. And as I open this sermon up with, unfortunately, it's not a fast process, but we can help the process by keeping our hunger and thirst after righteousness for the things of God alive. It's up to us to keep it alive. That's not God's job. He gave us the Holy Spirit. He kept his promise. But we have, and we did a teaching on the will. We have our free will to deal with. So our will, our free will lines up with the will of God. That is the goal. So the fruit of the spirit, gentleness. What is gentleness? Gentleness is kind, considerate, and tender when dealing with people. 
Gentleness is a calm demeanor, soft tone, and a compassionate attitude. Gentleness is sensitive to others' feelings, treating others with kindness and avoiding harshness and aggression. And those listening to this, how would you grade yourself on that? Now that I've mentioned that, don't, don't, don't say the grade out loud. But we know when we were in school and we didn't do so well on a test, we knew we had to study to do better on that test. And when we study the word of God, I don't know how the Holy Spirit does it, but he works it into our spirit man. That is the part that we don't see. And that spirit man takes dominion over that flesh we don't want to do the things of the flesh we want to live by the spirit why because we fed ourselves the things of god and we do that throughout our lives so we will look at gentleness shown in the old and new testament then we will try and understand how we as Christians can show the gentleness of God in our lives. And we can see God's strength and gentleness in Isaiah chapter 40 verses 10 through 11. Behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand and his arm shall rule for him. Behold. His reward is with him and his work before him. Verse 11. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom. That word bosom means close to his heart. And shall gently lead those that are with young. So we see in this verse the strength and power of God in verse 10. And verse 11 shows the careful and gentle nature of God. He is also described as a shepherd. And he's shown as a shepherd in Psalm 23, John 10, 11, and others. So we can read those when you get home and get them in your spirit so your spirit man will have something to work with god cares about the defenseless and helpless and the nobodies of society are somebody to god and that's shown in matthew 25 verse 40. So that means we just can't look at people and judge them from the outside cover that person that we're looking at and looking down upon is important to God. Continuing with gentleness in the Old Testament, we learn in Psalm 1835, David wrote, Thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation, and thy right hand hath holden me up. And thy gentleness hath made me great. So we have to know why David is writing this psalm here. And I'm going to get to that. Gentleness is not a sign of weakness, but a sign of power. We were taught maybe when we were coming up and in modern society, that power is associated with dominance and aggression. But that's not God's gentleness. That's not the fruit of the spirit gentleness. Gentleness refers to strength that comes from self-control, humility, and kindness. And David credits his strength to God's gentleness. So David was giving glory to God he credited his strength to God's gentleness. So during David's reign as king, he wrote this psalm reflecting on God's deliverance from his enemies 
and Saul. David said to God in Psalm 1835, and thy gentleness hath made me great. So we know that David was a great warrior and a great king, but he had a hard fall. We know about those things. David understood that true strength was not about overpowering others, but about being able to show patience and compassion in the face of adversity. So we're looking at the big picture and the outcome of the turnout of how things are going to happen and not the heat of the moment. Looking at David's life, we can see an example of patience and kindness. We know that David was anointed king by the prophet Samuel in 1 Samuel 16, 13. However, David waited for God's timing rather than just taking the throne by force. God told me that I was going to be king, so I'm going to make it happen. I've received a prophecy. I'm going to make it happen. No, David didn't do that. He waited on God's timing. Saul, the existing king, became jealous of David's successes. For example, Saul's jealousy starts in 1 Samuel 18, verses 6 through 9. He was jealous because of the praise and recognition that David was getting. Saul was jealous of David's other successes. The victory over Goliath shown in 1 Samuel 17. His military victories over the Philistines in several places in the Old Testament. But one of them is 2 Samuel verse 5 verse 17 through 25. I'm giving you these scriptures so that you will have something to do Bible study with. And when you study the Bible, when you read these scriptures, after hearing this sermon, and those that listen to the sermon a second time, it does confirm it into your spirit. Take those scriptures. This is how I learned the word of God. I looked up scriptures. I just took a scripture. My wife and I, we just took scriptures and looked them up in the context of what the scripture was about. In this case, it's gentleness. So then you get an understanding, a spiritual understanding. Remember, your spirit is eternal of what the word of God is about. And the spirit man will quicken you when situations come about. And you will be able, to, the spirit man will be able to use that word that you planted in you. If you don't plant anything there, don't be listening for voices if you haven't planted the word of God in you. Because you're going to hear the wrong voice. I guarantee you. Something told me. Yeah, I know what that something is. <laughs> We can't say something told me as Christians that know the word of God because we know what something is. One example is called an angel of light. So a safe thing to say would be the word of God told me. <laughs> That's how important the word is. That's how important the Bible is to get into your spirit person inside of you so Saul was jealous of David's military victories over the Philistines and I gave you the scripture reference and David's remarkable leadership ability is shown in 1 Samuel 18 verses 5 through 16 and in other places so we see in 1 Samuel 24 David had a chance to kill Saul. Saul had already tried to kill him. He even threw a javelin at him. But here in 1 Samuel 24, David spared Saul's life in a cave. 
Instead, David cut a piece of Saul's robe to show his restraint and respect for King Saul. And show he could have killed him. The act showed David's compassion, patience, and trust in God's plan in the face of adversity. He could have gotten his revenge right then, but he waited. But it wasn't him waiting. We already saw David proclaimed it was God's gentleness through him. When we read Psalm 1835. And thy gentleness hath made me great. So it wasn't David. It was the spirit of God working upon David. And that's what we have to remember. It's not our thing. It's not our goodness. It's not our love. It's not our fruit. It's God's fruit in us that creates the character of Christ as a testament to the word of God. And so our last Old Testament example of gentleness is in Proverbs 15, 1, and it tells us, A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. That's profound. How many have ever experienced this scripture? You don't have to raise your hand because I know it's all of us. Gentleness in our words and actions can stop tension and encourage understanding. So that statement right there gives us the encouragement to seek after gentleness. And it will stop so much pain and heartache and stress and anxiety in our lives. Because the worst thing is trying to uh, do the get back thing. I'm going to get you back. I'm going to win this argument. And by the end of it, the air is so full of anger, strife, hostility. And that scripture there, Proverbs 15, 1, says it on point. Gentleness in our words and actions can stop tension and encourage understanding. However, cruel words create conflict. One of the things that rejection does, once a person is rejected, rejection rejects back just naturally. So we have to guard ourselves against we know them to be spiritual in nature so we have to do the spiritual things of God which the word Proverbs 15 1 is spiritual is saying a soft answer so if we don't have that fruit working in our lives yet we can at least bite our tongue and try because God will give us an E for effort. Amen. <laughs> he will give us an E for effort. He will see that we're trying. He will see that we want to do it. But as we know anything in this life that's worthwhile, we might have a tendency to fail at it a few times till we finally get it. But that's when the Holy Spirit's going to come in and take charge. I don't know how it works. That's just the spirit of God. It's telling us how it works in the word of God. So we need to know through teaching and through our own Bible study where the Holy Spirit is present. Pray before you read the word of God and ask the Holy Spirit to show you the true meaning of the word of God and forbid a counterfeit in Jesus name. Cruel words create conflict. They create conflict. And that's why we could preach about the power of words from this time till next Sunday without break. And give the mic to each one of y'all. And one of y'all would have a sermon in you about words and how powerful they are. We use words to pray. 
Get that. That shows you the power of words. But it's words we pray. That's why we don't pray in that anger. We don't pray in that stress and that rejection. We don't pray under those type spirits. We have to get our spirit right before God to communicate with a holy God because those spirits are hindering our prayers. It's a hindrance. So how do we solve it? Simply repent before God. But we got to know what we're repenting about. We've got to know that we done something wrong before we can repent. <laughs> if we don't know what we've done, we're not going to repent. I've done nothing. Why am I repenting? We've got to know. This scripture in Proverbs 15, 1 encourages us to have a gentle spirit in all our relations. Family settings are the most challenging. That's where the battleground is. That is where the learning process, it will become real to you in your spirit. Because we say what we want when we want. If we can practice gentleness in our responses, we will get better results. Proverbs 15, 1 confidently says, a soft answer turns away strife. You might have to get a scar on your tongue. Oh, it's going to hurt your pride. It's going to hurt your feelings. How dare they say that? I'm so angry. Now let's look at a few New Testament examples of gentleness. A New Testament example of gentleness in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, one of our favorite scriptures here. Jesus invites us. This is an invitation. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And ye shall find rest unto your souls. So Jesus is the representation of gentleness. He encourages us to follow his example to find true peace. It just takes some time. It takes us some time and practice and breaking down of the flesh and our desires and God will be able to work in our spirits is possible. We just have to allow the Holy Spirit by submitting to the Holy Spirit. And how do we submit when we feel like saying something back in rejection? We don't say anything. We pray. And then go to that person. If it's your spouse, go to that, that person, not right away, but go to them and say, you know, baby, I love you. Give them a little kiss on the cheek. And that squashes the devil. That squashes his plans. And if we can practice that, we'll be on a honeymoon every day. <laughs> Amen. That's not a secret, really. It's not a secret, but it comes if we know the word of God and don't do it. To us, it is sin. James says it. If you know what to do right and you don't do it to that person is sin. It's sin to just talk any way we want when we know we aren't supposed to be doing it when we know the word of God tells us I know that sounds harsh but it's definitely not a good thing and it affects our spirit because our spirit man uh, our hearts would just get used to talking like that used to being like that some of us listening may have always been like that but God wants to change that 
That's what the inner transformation, now that we're under the law of the spirit, it's about an inner transformation, unlike the Mosaic law, which was in keeping of outward laws. But now we have the law of grace and mercy. So Jesus represents gentleness and he encourages us to follow his example. That's what he wants us to do. He says, take my yoke. And that is an act of surrendering and submitting to Jesus, studying and submitting to his teachings, letting go of our desires, our old ways of responding and aligning our lives with the will of God. Then he says, learn of me. Jesus is inviting us to learn who he is. That is a task in itself. And we won't know fully who he is until we see him. But he's inviting us to learn who he is and to follow his example, especially the qualities of gentleness and humility. And it says, find rest, finding rest. We all know there's worries and anxieties and stresses in this world to deal with. And if we consume them more than we consume the word of God, guess what? We're going to be stressed and anxious. Jesus offers us true rest and peace as we seek to walk in his ways. It's not religious. It's a way of life. It's a way of your spirit man that you do it without think your spirit man does it. You don't have to think about it because your spirit man takes dominion. We don't have to think about breathing. We just do it. And that's the way the things of the spirit will operate in our lives. We get the spirit of God within us coupled with develop your prayer life. Those that have the baptism, have you lost your ability to be able to pray in the spirit? Meekness and lowliness or humility. Jesus also represents meekness and humility. In this verse, he's encouraging believers to follow his example of meekness which is not weakness, but inner strength and control. Meekness is associated with a humble and teachable spirit before God and others. And that is the calamity that I've seen, the challenge that I've seen since I've been a pastor, since I've been a minister, since I've been a Christian. We can't get frustrated when people refuse to be taught or they refuse to listen to us. That's why we need that prayer life. So we can stay within the spirit. I call it keep. Remember what I call it. I said keeping your head above water prayers. That's what I call it. A teachable spirit. Being able to listen. You know I've counseled people. Since I've been a minister and I try to give godly counsel to see the person, just ignore it and go away and do what they're going to do. And God had to teach me and is teaching me even more that I cannot let that bother me because it is not against me. I can't take it personal and neither can anybody. If you're ministering to somebody, maybe it's a family member. If they're not listening to you, when they come to you at that moment and you're counseling them, you're telling them and they seem to be listening. But then they go off and do the exact same thing. That's when our prayers got to kick in. Ask God to open their eyes and pray 
And that will keep us from being anxious and overwhelmed with the situation. Take my yoke, Jesus said. Put it on Jesus. He said, learn of me. If we're stressed, tense, and anxious, it's going to come out in every part of our lives. Every single part of it. We won't have any rest for our souls at all. And God wants us to have rest. We all, pastors, people on the pews, every one of us needs to have a teachable spirit where the Holy Spirit can teach us. The Holy Spirit teaches us. Jesus said, I go, but I'm going to send the comforter. He shall guide you and teach you. So rely on the teachings of Jesus. Seek guidance from him. Humility is dependence on God and his authority. Also, humility promotes unity, selflessness, and having a servant's heart. So learn of Jesus through reading the Bible and prayer. Those two things coupled together. And God will add another dimension to your spirit, man. He will be able to work in your heart and in your life. And he will teach you how to pray. All you got to do, the Bible says, open your mouth and I will fill it in Psalms. And what that means is you're opening your mouth because you're thirsty for the things of God and the word of God. And you want to please God. That's all God is asking. The work that we do in the spirit realm is not an easy work, but it's a worthwhile and it produces awesome marvelous and fantastic results because God can surprise you so father in the name of Jesus we ask that we can display your gentleness Lord not as we were taught or as we saw in our lives that gentleness is a sign of weakness but Lord your word shows us it's a sign of strength your gentleness is a sign of strength and we saw that your servant David Gave you the credit for the awesomeness and for his greatness, Lord. He gave you the credit. And Lord, we give you the credit for everything that we do, Lord. That you do through us. We take authority over the enemy that tries to keep us from having the character of Christ in our lives. In our families, in our relations with our family members. Lord, help us in those areas to glorify Christ during the challenging times and times of adversity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.